Hi everyone, welcome to Farsight's Biotech and Health Extension Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. I'm so, so happy to have Vera Gobunilva here today from the University of Rochester. And as she already wanted to join us for our biotech uh, longevity workshop earlier this uh, year, where many of you here that are in the audience were, uh, and then flights got canceled at the last minute. So I'm so, so, so thrilled that uh, we finally have you here in the room. I think we reached out to you about more than a year ago. And so it's really cool that this uh, is finally happening. And I already had a little peek into your slides. I'm so, so, so excited to have you present on mechanisms of longevity, lessons from long-lived mammals. Um, and yeah, I mean, um, I think you've been doing really incredible work on this and, and for quite some time already. So I'm super, super excited for all the work that you, you'll be presenting to us. Um, a few words on the format um, for anyone who's new. Usually at the end of the hour, we get very cramped on questions. So if you have questions already that you really want us to tackle, drop them in the chat. Otherwise, the raise hand feature also works just fine. Okay, Vera, thank you so, so much for joining. I'll share more info on you in the chat. And from now on, the stage, the stage is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alison, for the introduction and for inviting me. Again, I'm also sorry I didn't make it to the meeting in the San Francisco. Yeah, we were on the way to the airport when <laughs> we learned that the flight is canceled. And well, I guess that happens a lot these days, unfortunately. Okay, so I'm, I'm really happy that I can meet with you now on Zoom. Uh, so today I will be talking about Okay, so here are my disclosures. I'm an SAB member on several companies that are linked to longevity. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about our work in comparative biology, where we analyze species with different lifespans with the goal of understanding the mechanisms uh, that are responsible for longevity. Uh, so here just the uh, picture of uh, you know different mammals and uh, I'm going to focus on mammals mainly today um, because well of course there are trees and uh, you know other like Greenland sharks that live even longer but and they are still very different from uh, mammals so I will just stick to this kingdom uh, but even within mammals we have more than hundredfold differences in maximum lifespan from two years in a shrew to over 200 years in the bowhead whale. Uh, and the approach we are using is to understand molecular mechanisms that are different between species that are short-lived and long-lived, uh, and then apply those mechanisms to benefit uh, human health. So here we also have naked mora that is very long-lived for a rodent. It lives more than 10 times longer than the mouse. We have buds hanging out there that are also very long-lived. So this is our general philosophy and like strategy, how we work. So we study those exceptionally long-lived animals. Uh, and you, here you have the whale, the naked mole rat, other creatures I will mention today. Uh, we identify those mechanisms that contribute to their longevity. Uh, then we generate those mouse models as a proof of principle uh, that um, this mechanism can actually be exported to other species. And then if we see that mice benefit from it, uh, so then we develop um, pharmacological approaches to achieve the same result. And now this can be used for human patients. Okay, so a quick story about the naked morad because this is our poster animal <laughs> for where we successfully implemented this approach. Uh, you probably heard about naked morads. Uh, they are not only very long-lived, more than 40 years, uh, but they're resistant to a variety of age-related diseases, including cancer, arthritis, heart disease, neurodegeneration. Uh, and they have many mechanisms that are contributing to their longevity. One of the very important mechanisms, and that was something that makes naked morad very unique, uh, is that they have evolved hyaluronic acid um, to be very abundant. So we also have some hyaluronic acid in our bodies, but in naked molars, there is like 10 times more of it. Uh, it's a major component of extracellular matrix, 
Uh, and in the naked morat, it is extremely abundant. And also it's a polysaccharide in the naked morat. It is very, very long. Uh, so how does it help naked morat? So what we showed already some years ago was that uh, in the naked morat, this unique hyaluronic acid contributes to cancer resistance. Uh, and that work received all of these prizes. Uh, but we were interested whether we can take this uh, mechanism and then move it from naked mora to another species to the mouse and see if mice would benefit. So we generated this transgenic mouse uh, that expressed naked mora gene for hyaluronic synthesis. And uh, we followed this transgenic mice looking at the health and lifespan. Uh, so this is cancer experiment. So we induced cancer in mice. And uh, those mice that had naked mora gene expressed in them had much fewer tumors. So it provides cancer resistance. Uh, also, uh, these mice were longer lived. So these are mice uh, that we just let them live their entire life. Uh, and we see that the mice with naked mora transgene, uh, they live about 10% longer. So that was quite remarkable. And now, of course, we are thinking how to implement the same strategy for human beings because we see that it is protective from cancer, but it also gives benefits beyond cancer. Uh, we see that these mice are not only long-lived, they also have lower frailty scores, they are maintain better their muscle mass, their bone density. So it is caloronic acid con contributes to other um, pro-longevity mechanisms. And, uh, you know, just to say a few more words here. Um, so now we are developing strategies how to apply it to humans. And of course, transgenic mouse was a proof of principle. Uh, we are not thinking about gene therapy in humans, but rather we are thinking of developing a small molecule inhibitors of hyaluronic degradation. And this way we can upregulate our endogenous hyaluronic acid and achieve the same situation as in the naked morad. Uh, also, I should say, well, this increase in lifespan is quite modest if you think about naked morad that lives 10 times longer. Uh, but I must say that in these mice, we had actually very modest increase in, in total hyaluronic. Uh, it was nowhere near what we get in the naked morad because we increased the synthesis, but we didn't do anything about degradation. And in mice, hyaluronin is very rapidly recycled. Uh, so we are thinking that if we slow down the degradation, we can achieve even greater effects. So now let me switch gears and talk about other projects that we are developing in this comparative sense and that have to do with genome and epigenome stability. Our DNA is bombarded, you know, by different um, factors from external uh, to internal that lead to mutations, damage in DNA. Uh, and, you know, when there is damage in DNA and it's repaired incorrectly, it results in mutations and those mutations accumulate. And this for a long time was believed to be, you know, like the underlying mechanism of aging. Although, you know, some people would still question that. For example, the question would be, is this like, okay, we accumulate mutations and with age that this is the fact, uh, but is this enough to account for all those age-related changes in tissue function and physiological capacity? Or we still have, you know, do we get enough genes, uh, mutations in genes that matter? Uh, and um, uh, to address this, um, we, you know, a, a new way of thinking has developed because mutations is just one component of what's going wrong. Uh, but there is also a change in the epigenome. And in the last, you know, I would say five years or so, there was increased appreciation of how important the epigenome is for longevity because mutations, we're talking about DNA sequence, but now what about how DNA is packaged in the nucleus? Because this is even more important uh, to provide for faithful <laughs> work of the cell because genes that have to be expressed have to be open, genes that need to be silenced have to be closed. And every time you, um, you know, sort of engage the DNA in repair or replication, transcription, 
all of this packaging has to be opened and closed and put back in the same way it was before. And so there is, a, you know, here there is double stand break repair and that can uh, generate not only mutations, but also these changes to the epigenome structure, because imagine if there was a translocation or inversion like that. So it doesn't just change these two genes that are involved, but it changes the whole way chromatin is organized. So this is why double stem brick repair is so important. And because it kind of reaches beyond the immediate gene that suffers the mutation, it actually affects the whole packaging of the DNA around it. And here is this concept of uh, epigenetic, epigenomic drift. So things just drift <laughs> with time. Um, the more you access the DNA, the more you change the packaging. Over time, it looks less than what it was in the young organism. And here, this concept, I try to show it, you know, in a simple cartoon that in the young cells, DNA is packaged very neatly. There are some closed domains, there are some open domains, and epigenetic landscape is sharp. So there are sharp boundaries between those genes that have to be open and closed. But with aging, the structure unravels and it starts to be like that. The epigenetic landscape smoothens. So now every cell kind of is not so well coordinated with other cell. Some genes are expressed that shouldn't be expressed in this cell or in this particular tissue type. So it resembles this idea of a sock drawer. Uh, so the, 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 this is the sock drawer. In the beginning of the week, like everything is neatly packaged and folded, but as we, you know, reach for socks and then try to put them back. So that's what it looks after some time. And this is the same thing goes for our epigenome. So as we get older, you know, it's not, it's no longer packaged so well. It's more like this disarray, <laughs> disarray <laughs> in the sock drawer. And so here is the concept of epigenomic drift. And uh, we wanted to ask the question whether double stem break repair, which is so important, not only with respect to mutations, but also with respect to this epigenomic packaging, and does it correlate with maximum lifespan of species? And we took 20 different species of rodents. Uh, and here are just some of them that are very diverse in their maximum lifespans. Uh, and we measured the efficiency of double strand break repair in these species and tested whether it correlates with longevity. So I'm just showing you the summary of this work because it was published two years ago. So what we found was that there was a very strong positive correlation between maximum lifespan and the efficiency of double strand break repair. And then when we searched for mechanisms responsible for it, like what's different between short-lived species versus these long-lived species, uh, we found that the gene called sirtuin 6 or 36 uh, was responsible for the major part of this correlation. And we could swap sirtuin 6 between cells of, let's say, mouse and beaver, and it would change the repair efficiency completely. And then we uh, focused on sirtuin 6, and we were able to identify five amino acids that we could swap between mouse and beaver and make mouse cell 6 just as active as beaver cell 6. So that was very exciting. Now we see that double stem break repair correlates with longevity and we can find this one gene uh, that plays very important role in giving long-lived species more active DNA repair. And we were also interested if sirtuin 6 uh, plays a role, you know, within species. Uh, for example, if uh, longer-lived people would have more active CERT-6. Uh, so here we collaborated with a group of Yusin Su from Columbia University, and she was sequencing DNA repair genes from human centenarians, uh, looking for coding mutations or any kind of alleles that are enriched in centenarians. And she identified inserts. So it's actually very rare to find coding allele that is associated with longer life. But for CERT6, she succeeded. Uh, there were two mutations in the C terminus of CERT6 that were enriched in human centenarians. So we engineered these proteins and we wanted to analyze its molecular function. So we took centenarian version of CERT6 
and tested it in the same DNA repair assay as we did for the animals. Uh, so here we are comparing wild type CERT6, and these are single mutations versus double mutation that's found in centenarians. Um, and you see that they provide more efficient double stand break repair, both by homologous recombination and non-homologous and joining pathways. So now this allele of CERT6 uh, in centenarians is actually better at repairing DNA. So there is another function for CERT6 that is very um, closely connected to this concept of epigenomic drift. Uh, and this is the role of CERT6 in silencing transposable elements. Because if this is our genome, uh, protein coding genes are just a very small fraction of it. Uh, but there is a lot of repetitive elements. And about 30% of our genome is composed of so-called transposable elements, lines and signs, which are nothing else but genomic parasites that just live in our genomes, you know, selfish creatures. As we get older, those um, transposons become activated, and that may lead to various negative consequences, including inflammation, uh, mutations. So one of the roles of CERT6 is suppressing these transposable elements, so because it's a silencing chromatin regulator, and it binds to transposable elements and makes packages them into heterochromatin, so they don't get expressed. So here we took centenarian CERT6 and tested if it's any better than the wild type human CERT6 at this function of silencing transposons. So here we are measuring expression of line one elements. Uh, and this is a, our sort of the baseline is the wild type human CERT6 like all of us, most of us have. Uh, so that would be our baseline, and now we are comparing it to expression in the cells that express centenarian CERT6, and you see that it's lower. So centenarian protein is actually better at silencing transposable elements. So we were interested, uh, what else is different about this centenarian CERT6? Does it interact with other types of proteins? So we've done... Um, IP and mass spectrometry to identify the interactome and compare the interactome of the wild type CERT6 with centenarian CERT6. Uh, and we found that they interact with the same proteins, but there was some a group of proteins that were binding more strongly to centenarian CERT6. And the, the most confident hit here was lamin A. So lamin A is a very interesting protein. So this is a protein that provides a scaffold for the nucleus. Again, epigenomes okay, helps organize things within the nucleus. And mutations in lamin A are associated with a variety of human genetic syndromes. Uh, the best known is hutchison guilford progeria or premature aging syndrome. So these children uh, usually only survive to their teenage years and they die often from cardiovascular complications. Uh, there are so this is where you mutate lamin A and you shorten lifespan dramatically. Uh, but there are also polymorphisms in lamin A that are associated with longer lifespan. For example, there are these SNPs that are enriched in centenarians. So again, by regulating this epigenome packaging, uh, you can uh, influence longevity. And what we find that CERT6 uh, from centenarians interacts more strongly to lamin A. So this is the summary of this study. Uh, where we showed that uh, changing or enhancing CERT6 function in, in, can actually contribute to longevity within humans, and, and there are uh, mutations that are enriched in centenarian populations uh, that confer more efficient DNA repair, better silencing of transposons. I didn't show this data, but it, they're also more efficient at killing cancer cells, so it may be protecting uh, long-lived people from cancer. Uh, so this part I kind of skipped, but I will mention it now. When we also examine the function of the centenarian CERT6 in vitro as an enzyme, uh, we found that there was a, a, some change in enzymatic activity. So CERT6 is an epigenetic regulator, and it can deacetylate histones, which results in chromatin compaction. It can also monoADP ribosylate uh, the proteins, including many proteins that deal with chromatin. So strangely, in the centenarian uh, CERT6, 
this activity was reduced compared to the wild type and this activity was enhanced. So it will be important later in my talk. Uh, and then finally, we found that Centenarian Cert6 binds strongly to lamin A, and that again may be helping, helping maintain uh, the structure of the nucleus better. So now let me talk for a few minutes about the bowhead whale. Uh, this is the longest lived mammal on earth. It lives more than 211 years, and it's also very large. So we were quite interested in the mechanism of longevity and also cancer resistance in the whale, because imagine having such a large body um, and not developing cancer, which starts from a single cell, because they have many more cells than we do. So what we found for the bowhead whale uh, is that they have extremely accurate double stand break repair. So that's the same pathway of repair that we find to correlate with maximum lifespan. So in the whale, uh, it is, you know, like more than three times uh, better than in humans. So you see repair efficiency. <clears throat> and in addition, it's also very accurate because in non-homologous and joining repair, when both strands of DNA are broken, then they need to be fused somehow. Uh, and often it results in a mutation at the junction. Uh, so in humans, only 15% of junctions that we observed were precise, but in bowhead whale, no, 60% were precise. So whale generates much fewer mutations. Um, and uh, here there is another assay for measuring double step break repair, just to confirm the same result with a different assay. Uh, you see that in bowhead whale, if we irradiate the cells, uh, it is much more efficient uh, it repairing, you know, removing those micronuclei. So, you know, like the more micronuclei is a bad thing. Uh, so here, whale is better at repairing DNA measured by a different assay. And finally, looking at uh, mutation frequencies, uh, here we compared several species, mouse, cow, human. Uh, you can see that whale is the most precise. It almost, almost no deletions and a lot of precise events. Uh, so that again may help whale uh, not develop mutations and also maintain more stable genome. So we were interested how whales do that. Uh, and we done proteomics on the whale and we looked at different proteins involved in repair. And one protein really stood out from that proteomics analysis. Uh, the protein is called KIRB or cold induced RNA binding protein. Uh, it was present in the whale in the very high levels, like hundredfold that of human. And this protein is also involved in double stand break repair. It comes to double stand break and helps modify chromatin there uh, to attract uh, other repair enzymes. So we took this protein from the whale and we expressed it in human cells and then measured DNA repair and we see that it was enough to improve DNA repair in human cells by about you know two three fold, uh, which is actually quite remarkable because humans have very good DNA repair. It's difficult to improve upon it, but with the whale kirp, uh, we were able to do that. Uh, and then we were interested: what about our endogenous kirp? Because it's supposed to be induced with cold exposure. Uh, so we took human cells and put them at twenty two degrees for two hours and then measured DNA repair. And that was enough to stimulate DNA repair. So here you may think, you know, this kind of exercises of dipping in cold water may be beneficial by inducing cold proteins uh, and uh, improving DNA repair. Of course, prolonged hypothermia is not, uh, um, you know, maybe detrimental for many other reasons, but perhaps there is some benefit in these folk remedies of short uh, cold exposure. So here is a summary about the wheel. We found that it has much uh, more efficient and accurate double stand break repair, which is mediated by this protein curb that's induced by cold. Uh, so here, you know, very briefly, another project where we decided to use an unbiased approach and to see what uh, processes correlate uh, with longer lifespan across multiple species, because there we kind of started with DNA repair and that's what we saw. But here we sequence, we perform RNA sequencing on 26 species of rodents. And then we just look at what expression of what genes correlate positively or negatively with maximum lifespan. 
Uh, so let me just cut to the chase to save time. So these are different processes that were negatively regulated. We have here metabolic processes, inflammation. So these were all more highly expressed in shorter lived species. Now, what was highly expressed in longer lived? That's what's interesting. And here, the most exciting cluster was this one that includes DNA repair, uh, homologous recombination, and double stand break repair genes. So here in completely unbiased approach, we get to the same result that the genome stability is extremely important and it correlates positively uh, with maximum lifespan. Uh, so we also analyzed in the same study uh, regulatory networks and we looked at what factors regulate those genes uh, that are either positively or negatively correlated with lifespan. And what we found that uh, circadian transcription factors were regulating the negative lifespan genes. So again, what we can conclude from this, you know, in practical terms, that it's important to maintain your circadian rhythm and not to disrupt it, because if, let's say, you are very active at night, so that can stimulate expression of those negative lifespan genes. Uh, and maybe in long-lived species, there is the stronger circadian control that limits expression of these metabolic genes to a particular time of day, so it doesn't shorten lifespan. And now the positive lifespan genes were regulated by transcription factors in the pluripotency network, which is a very exciting result. Uh, you probably well aware uh, about recent studies on epigenetic reprogramming uh, where pluripotency transcription factors could rejuvenate the cells and even mice. Uh, but that was kind of an engineered artificial situation. And here we found that uh, evolution uh, normally when evolving species with longer lifespan upregulated the expression of these genes that are controlled by pluripotency network. Uh, so, okay, let's, you know, come back to where we started. Uh, there is this process of epigenetic drift, uh, and then how do we bring it back? So I mentioned pluripotency network, so we know this is what can rewire chromatin completely back to its original state. Uh, but the danger with that is that it often can change cell identity, it may result in cancer. So it is good as a proof of principle, but it may have a long way to go uh, for you know, practical translational applications. So we were interested, let's try, you know, maybe a more conservative strategies uh, to achieve the same result. And here we thought, well, if CERT-6 is important uh, for, you know, like silencing transposons, uh, packaging things into repressive heterochromatin, let's see if it rejuvenates methylation age. Uh, so this was done in collaboration with Steve Horvitz. Um, we took cells from older subjects, uh, and then we express CERT-6 in these cells for two weeks, and then measure methylation age uh, in control cells and in cells that were expressing CERT-6. And you can see that in nine out of 10 um, cell lines that were each one derived from a different person, uh, methylation age went down after just two weeks of CERT-6 overexpression. And when we did RNA sequencing on these cells and looked at what the transcription patterns have changed, you can see changes related to chromatin, DNA conformation change, chromatin accessibility, DNA packaging. So all those things we discussed were relevant to what CERT-6 may be doing. And then we thought, okay, well, this was, we overexpressed CERT-6, the transgene. Uh, can we stimulate it chemically? And of course, because CERT-6 was known to extend lifespan in mice for some time, uh, people were looking for CERT-6 activators, but most efforts were focused on CERT-6 deacetylation activity that I mentioned a little bit earlier. But from the analysis of centenarian CERT-6, we found that this activity actually may not be important for longevity, but the other one, ribosylation, was enhanced. Uh, so what we did here, because we wanted to find activators of uh, ribosylation activity. Uh, so we took from the literature uh, several chemical activators of CERT-6 that were reported to activate deacetylation activity. And we assayed them uh, whether they will also activate ribosylation activity. 
And most of them did absolutely nothing, like this MD 800 didn't change a thing. Uh, but there was one molecule that was a very strong activator of both. And this is an interesting molecule, it's called fucoidin. Uh, it was first discovered by Ruin Moadel. Uh, it comes from seaweed. So it's a, it's a polysaccharide that's abundant in seaweed. So this is the brown seaweed. Uh, and um, fucoidin, it's a polysaccharide composed of these fucose sugar monomers. Uh, but there is also some heterogeneity because it's a natural product. Uh, so it can be sulfated. Uh, it could also have branch length. So different species of brown algae produced somewhat different fucoidins. Uh, and we screened uh, many different <laughs> fucoidins from different seaweeds. And we found that about um, one third of what we screened activated certain things. The rest didn't do anything. Uh, and then we decided, okay, let's see if it has some effect in vivo. Uh, so we gave a fucoidin that is a CERT6 activator. Uh, we gave it to aged mice. So we obtained mice that already at 14 months of age. So they're already starting to get frail at this age. And we fed them fucoidin for several months. So this experiment is ongoing. Uh, and we measured frailty score, which is very similar to the frailty score that, you know, used for people. So there is walking speed, grip strength, so all this combined in a single score. Uh, and you can see that mice on Fukuidin had significantly lower frailty scores. And here we are going, you know, like two months, three months, four months. So mice are getting older, the frailty scores are increasing, but those are, that are taking seaweed supplement are still, uh, looking much better than the control mice. So these are some pictures of the mice on Fukuiden and control. So they, they start to look old, but the Fukuiden mice are really looking better. And, um, you know, there is still a lot of work to be done uh, to understand exactly how this um, Fukuiden activates CERT6 to maybe find better small molecule activators. Uh, but uh, to summarize my today's talk, what I can say that um, there is this process of epigenetic drift with the age our epigenome unravels and opens up. Uh, and there are different strategies, and this process is probably the underlying cause of aging uh, that causes you know, many other things to go wrong. Um, so how do we reverse it? So there are different approaches that include putting epigenome back together, very drastic approaches epigenetic rejuvenation with Yamanaka factors, but we can also use uh, safer approaches, for example, stimulating CERT6 and not changing cell identity, but just uh, packaging uh, epigenome, you know, especially those repetitive elements back into heterochromatin. And right now we are also gearing up for a small pilot clinical trial. So we uh, will be giving Fukuidin uh, that activates CERT6 uh, to cancer patients when they're recovering from chemo, because this is the time when people really need to put their epigenome back together after being exposed to radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, so during this time, we will give people Fukuidin supplement, um, and then we will measure um, different, you know, uh, health, um, uh, perform different health assessments, uh, frailty scores, like we did for the mice, blood chemistry, and of course, epigenetic methylation clock and see whether um, Fukuidin also helps people. Um, okay, so that's it. And uh, I would like to thank members of my team. So this is our group. Um, just recently, I showed you the work of many people that participated. It's a, um, Ali is the person doing the mouse experiment with Fukuidin, uh, Yu Yang, um, did bioinformatics, uh, comparing transcriptomes. Jihui works with the mice that express naked molar at hyaluronan gene, and Andrei Siluanov is my uh, co-PI and uh, long-term collaborator, and we have also many collaborators. Uh, we're also looking for new people to join our team, and many external collaborators, including Jan Vig, Vadim Gladyshev, John Sedevi, Steve Horwitz, and many, many others. 
So thank you for your attention. Wow, wonderful. Uh, thank you so, so much. This was quite the walkthrough and we have a ton of questions already geared up. So rather than thanking you for a very long time, I'm going to uh, try to get to as many as we can. The first one I'm going to ask, because there's no mic uh, from the asker, which is what percentage of human centenarians had CERT6 mutations? Yeah, so that's a very good question. A very small percentage, uh, because as you know, one of the big problems with any kind of human GWA studies of longevity is that the centenarian phenotype is composed of many different alleles that you know all together make these combinations. Um, so it, it, it's a very rare allele, uh, and we also had the, of course, struggled with the statistical genetics to show the significance because we only have, let's say, 500 centenarians and for good statistical genetics research, you need about 10,000. Uh, but what we did then to address this problem, uh, we took a large <clears throat> database uh, that has, uh, you know, hundred thousands of people in it. And we just looked whether this mutation is enriched in people older than 75, and it was. So just in people who made it to the age of 75, this mutation is enriched, but it's still very rare. So I think, you know, our chance of having it in our genomes <laughs> is not very high, um, but this is why, you know, we can try to look for the activator molecules instead. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, Carl. So you um, listed several ways that CERT6, several methods of action that, that are protective uh, for CERT6 to increase longevity and, and, and that presumably are part of how centenary variants of CERT6 uh, are even better. Um, do we have any data that can help us um, weight the different contributions of those methods of action? You know, we, you know how much of the CERT6 benefit is DNA repair versus retrotransposon suppression versus the other things you listed? Do we have any data on that that can help speak to that? Well, we are trying, you know, this is a very good question. We are trying to address this. Uh, we have uh, different mutant mouse models that we are studying right now uh, that can kind of uh, shift the balance with, between these two different roles. Uh, for example, we have mice with constantly active CERT6, but in a way that it really geared towards double strand breaks. Uh, and these mice can survive gamma radiation, lethal doses of gamma radiation, very striking phenotype. We can give, give them 10 grays of radiation and they just survive. Um, so they, uh, early on in their life, they're fairly normal, uh, but now we've done lifespan studies on them and they show somewhat reduced lifespan. So if we completely direct CERT6 towards double stern breaks and abandon transposons, it actually, is not very helpful. Uh, so, you know, those mice are fairly healthy. They make it past two years of age, but they're, you know, overall they, they show faster aging than the, um, uh, than the wild type. We also have mice uh, that have more synthesis geared towards transposons. And those mice, you know, we're still looking at that lifespan curve because, you know, <laughs> those the experiments take a long time. And early on, we had the signal that was showing they're going to live longer. Uh, but then somehow when, you know, we've accumulated more numbers and now it seems they are similar to wild, uh, which may tell us that, well, perhaps suppression of transposals is really important. Maybe if you really take away from double stand breaks and send everything to transposons, it, it doesn't result in lifespan extension. Although early on we had this signal that maybe they would be longer lived. Uh, so what I can tell you, perhaps both are important. If we just, you know, in relative terms, maybe suppressing transposons and all this junk DNA is somewhat more important, uh, but it, it's really difficult to, to say, you know, be definitive about that. Thanks. Great, Carl Sabi. Next one, we have Abdul Kader. Yes, hi. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I have uh, the question is, um, I expect selective uh, uh, activation in stem cells, uh, probably 
somatic uh, stem cells. So I, I, I was wondering whether uh, there is uh, more activity of cell to six in this cell. And the other question was uh, about tumorogenicity. You see that in some cases, they report actually cell six to be oncogenic, uh, not repressor, but actually activator. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, cell six, you know, the first part of the question, yes, it is present in stem cells. It's actually more abundant in cells that are, uh, proliferate more highly. So there is a link to cell cycle. Uh, but there, there is another cell to insert seven that is very similar to cell six. It does some of the same functions, but different. And that cell seven seems to be more specific for regulating stem cell biology. And cell six seems to be, you know, more like everywhere. Uh, so now to your question about tumor uh, being, is it a tumor suppressor or does it promote cancer? Uh, so it is a tumor suppressor. So there is a very nice paper by Raul Mostoslavsky demonstrating that CER6 is a tumor suppressor. You can take CER6 knockout cells. They are much more easily uh, turned into cancer. Uh, now, that being said, there is a subset of cancer, uh, in particularly blood cancers like leukemias, uh, where CER6 uh, is amplified because CER6 expression is lost in many other types of cancer, many solid tumors, but in these leukemias, it's upregulated. So what does it mean? Um, most likely what it means is because CER6 is needed to promote genome stability and cancer cells proliferate a lot. So often cancer cells become addicted to particular DNA repair enzymes just be to maintain themselves because they are so unstable intrinsically, they just need to upregulate these functions to survive. Uh, and that the same actually is observed with other DNA repair proteins that often cancer cells are really dependent on particular DNA repair pathways. And that's, um, you know, like therapy with PARP1 inhibitors is based on the same idea. Uh, but part one is not an oncogen, but it just cancer cells become addicted to it. And the same thing with cell six, it is amplified in certain cell types um, because they need it to survive, but it, it doesn't promote tumorogenesis by itself. It actually is a tumor suppressor. Wonderful. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, very, very nice talk. Um, my question is about your, in your presentation, you, you spoke about animals that are very long lived and it seems like they, they're associated with extreme environments. Some are on the ground, some are in very cold waters. Um, they have to adapt to, to, to those environments. And then you have stress proteins that are highly active. Um, on the other side. There's cases where you have those proteins just being different and mutated. And my question is, what is the participation of the genetic backgrounds, the nature of the animals, and what is the participation of the nurture of the animals? That is the environmental exposures, the control of over the, the cert twins. So should we look at the differentiating different cert twins that the animals have, or should we look at different control over the cert twins? Well, so the environment of course contributes uh, to lifespan, um, but relative contribution, if you compare a mouse to a whale, it doesn't matter if you put mouse to, in the ocean, it's not going to live 200 years because the genetic component is of course much, much stronger, but you can alter the environment of the mouse and you can, you know, maybe increase its lifespan by 10 to 20%. So we are talking about different kind of orders of magnitude here. Um, and um, similarly like with sirtuins, yes. So there are certain stressors uh, that can stimulate sirtuins and often, you know, maybe color restriction was shown to stimulate sirtuin one. Um, but uh, again, the effects are different. So when we are talking about cross species, there is a greater genetic component. Uh, of course, here you also asked like they live in these extreme environments. So what is happening? So here, I think in evolutionary terms, uh, what matters is not so much whether the environment is extreme, but whether it provides the species with 
safe environment that ex reduces extrinsic mortality. Uh, and then it makes evolutionary sense for the species to evolve longer lifespan because uh, if you are a mouse and you are going to be eaten uh, some, sometime, you know, after the first birthday, so there is no reason, no evolutionary reason to evolve longevity because there will be no benefit for the species. Uh, but uh, creatures like naked morons that live underground, the whales that live in the ocean and are so large that nobody can really attack them. So then they evolve this longevity because for them it actually makes evolutionary benefit. Happy. Great. Um, next one we have um, H to support us. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I just had a question. Um, what are your thoughts on the various uh, CERT-6 activators that exist today? You know, I've heard of things like um, NMN or reserve, you know, reserve patrol, things like that. And, and what, what's kind of on the horizon, how far are we from, from maybe something a, a little, little bit better? So like today, like what are the best things? And then what, what should we be looking out for maybe, maybe soon? Well, yeah, so there are many things on the market available today, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and there are more supplements now that have the scientific basis for them rather than, you know, just somebody said something. Um, so NMN and NR, the NAD boosters became, you know, very popular lately. I just came back from a FASIB conference that I co-organized on NAD metabolism and signaling. <laughs> so these supplements were discussed heavily. So I think this is still a bit of an open question. Uh, they definitely benefit a particular condition, especially muscle health. Uh, so to address loss of agilated sarcopenia. So there, there is very good data showing benefit uh, of NAD supple supplementation. Um, with respect to just lifespan, that there is really no good data <laughs> that NAD supplements help. Uh, but, the, you know, people take them and they think more data will become available uh, soon, whether there is benefit for lifespan, but for muscle health, that's definitely beneficial. Uh, and there are, of course, you know, many more molecules. Uh, with CERT-6 activators, there isn't so much available at this point. Uh, well, people often take an AD with the hope of stimulating sirtuins. Uh, because uh, sirtuins are NAD-dependent enzymes and they need it as a cofactor. Uh, but here I should say that SIRT1 is very sensitive to NAD concentration, uh, while SIRT6 is not. It has a very strong binding to NAD and minor like physiological fluctuations in NAD concentrations do not change the SIRT6 activity. So this is why for SIRT6 activation, we really need to look for more specific activators rather than NAD, and that's what we are doing. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. Eric, great. Yeah, um, do, it's a two-parter. Do you have any plans to look at non-mammal species for examples of longevity? And then uh, what's your current, what's your opinion on like the current range of model organisms for longevity? Do you feel like they're like philosophically in the right direction? Well, I, I'm very happy to see that people use a you know, greater diversity of models because uh, when aging research was just in its infancy, people focused very heavily uh, on a couple of invertebrate models that are convenient and you can do lifespan assays uh, very quickly. Uh, but then if you work with something like C. elegans on drosophila that is so short-lived, so you will identify conserved pathways, but if there are some pathways that are more specific to long-lived species, you might as well miss them entirely. And right now people are looking much broader and I think we have to focus more on long-lived species to find something, what we're really looking for and not just looking under the street light where it's easy to see. Right. Um, did, but do you, do you have any plans to look at non-mammal species? Oh yeah, that's right. Well, you know, I'm thinking about it um, maybe at some point I will. Uh, we have a lot of work to do with mammals right now. You know, one thing that maybe 
uh, keeps me away from doing it is that many non-mammal species that are exceptionally long-lived, uh, they also have extremely slow metabolism. If you think of a tortoise or Greenland shark, uh, they can eat, you know, once in a few months and be just fine. And, and they, they just live very, very slowly. Uh, and we as warm-blooded mammals, we just don't use this strategy. You know, we have certain mm -hmm. metabolism that we have to somehow accommodate and combine it with longevity, but we cannot just slow ourselves down. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, um, we have class. Oh, you're going to do Micah's first. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on um, moving beyond small molecules? So, you know, maybe, for example, mRNA uh, to deliver not just CERT-6, uh, but maybe even the more beneficial centenarian variants, which is, yeah, you know, you can't obviously activate with small molecules because they're not. Yeah, we are working on it. Um with the industry partners and uh, I think there is a potential here of course as with any gene therapy you have to be you know sure you are safe uh, and then of course delivery is often big limitation um, because uh, you know small molecule can be taken orally or injected and then it goes everywhere uh, with mRNA we're still not at that point so at this time we're just uh, targeting liver uh, and we will look, you know, how it affects the liver because that's where most of the things end up that are being injected. But um, the, the delivery point is a really good uh, point, and that brings up uh, the scientific question, which is to the extent to which we have in preclinical models, you know, demonstration of lifespan extension. Like, how have you looked at like which tissues getting the the, the upregulation of CERT six that you know are primarily responsible for the extra healthy lifespan? Uh, well, we don't know the simple answer is. Uh, so the mouse that was used to demonstrate lifespan exp extension with CERT-6 was uh, a whole body overexpression, but it was done as a transgene uh, in uh, Michael Cohen's, uh, Chaim Cohen's group uh, in Israel. Uh, so that was a simple transgene uh, that got silenced in many tissues. So they had some expression in the liver and a bunch of other tissues. It wasn't very uniform. Um, so right now we are actually engineering mice that will have uh, human and also centenarian versions of CERT-6 knocked into a ROSA-26 locus, which is a locus that doesn't get silenced easily. So we will have expression in different tissues. So first of all, we'll just see if we have greater lifespan benefit than with that model that was expressing mouse six and in kind of a patchy manner. Uh, so we'll see how that differ. And of course, then it would be nice to target it to different tissues, which can be done with our construct because uh, it is in ROSA 26. And then these mice can be bred uh, to different drivers. So we can actually target the expression to different tissues and see which one is critical. Uh, and, you know, we still don't really know which tissue is limiting for longevity. Some people would say brain, some people would say heart. Uh, but these are all, you know, excellent questions we can address with this model. Thanks for a great talk. I'm going to show my wife the sock drawer analogy because I hate folding socks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh-oh, you created a monster there, Vera. <laughs> okay, a great question for Micah is, are you aware of anyone of this work on a variation of curb that doesn't require cold induction or any similar molecules on in nature that do the same thing without the cold requirement. Yeah, no, that would be great if we could just stimulate KIRP. Uh, you know, this result is very new. It's not published. We're just writing up the manuscript, so we haven't really explored it enough. I don't know if there are activating molecules. You know, one safe strategy, of course, is okay, jumping in cold water, but it may, may not be palatable for everyone uh so we'll definitely be you know doing more work in this direction to see if we can activate it with small molecules but right, right now we don't have any then i always have two questions at the end um which are a little bit more general 
One is if you think about the field that you're working in, is there, and you know, you think about someone, um, you know, a young person entering your field, what's the challenge that you want to draw their attention to? Like if you could, you know, direct, if you had a wish list that someone else could work on that would advance work in your area, what would that, what would be on the list? Well, you know, you sent me this question by email and I kept thinking about it. I didn't send you the answer because I don't know, there are so many different questions I want to ask. You know, I think we would like uh, to understand how exactly epigenome changes with age because we understand, you know, in general terms, okay, things open up and, uh, but, you know, to get kind of a much better, more detailed understanding of what is happening. Uh, and then also to have a strategy to manipulate it also in a more controlled way. So I think these would be uh, strategies that can really lead to reverse the aging process or this, this pathway of aging. Now Kriyan has a quick one. Oh yeah, thanks Allison. Um, I, my question uh, is, if you care to discuss it, do you have any personal um, longevity protocols that you implement on yourself? Do you take this, um, what's it called? This, the food, food, the seaweed thing, the um, fucoidin, fucoidin, or anything else? Do you plunge in cold water or take hot saunas or like take uh, NMN or exercises? diet a certain way, if you care to say it, I know this personal question and might be kind of unprofessional, but if so, excuse me. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to answer. Well, I, I don't take many supplements uh, because I thought, well, you know, maybe so far, you know, I'm holding <laughs> my health together. Okay. So I will trying to minimize that, but I think after a certain age, you know, maybe when I hit 60, I will start taking more. Uh, so at this time, yeah, I am taking Fucoidin. I'm also trying to incorporate seaweed into my diet because the, you know, that's where Fucoidin comes from. Uh, something else interesting about, um, diet and, and seaweed. Um, so it is consumed in very large amounts in the, the diet in South Korea and Japan, which are two countries with, uh, the highest life expectancies. And, and that's also reassuring. Uh, so I am trying to incorporate other, you know, components of uh, the diet in, in those countries, including seafood, uh, kimchi, which is a great source for microbiome. So it's fermented uh, cabbage. Uh, so we, are, you know, I'm trying to eat it uh, regularly. Also components of Mediterranean diet, you know, olive oil, fruits and vegetables. Uh, so these are sort of general things, you know, moderate exercise. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to skip lunch. Uh, so I have some, you know, time without a kind of intermittent fasting. I eat breakfast and dinner and also one day a week, I like Mondays, I'm trying to not to eat it <laughs> when it's possible. I travel a lot, so it's not always possible, but these are my general strategies. <laughs> If you have one more minute, there's one more question in the chat that has brought up, which is from Matthew. Hey, um, so I was curious if you thought it was viable to use things like uh, defective CAS uh, approaches to force the upregulation of something like the SIRPA, or uh, any of these genes without relying, for example, on, uh, you know, natural induction via cold or something like that, just, just turning up the regulation, uh, epigenetically in, uh, in a, you know, adult animal. Yes. You know, that, that's a good uh, idea, right? So, because often for, you know, enzymes, you can look for small molecules that will, you know, target active site, but, but for KIRP, it's not really an enzyme. It's sort of an accessory protein. So maybe playing with expression levels would be best. So something I, I didn't go into details, but when we compare the human kirp to whale kirp, uh, we couldn't actually so easily overexpress kirp. Even if we put it on the strong promoter, we couldn't get to the same levels. Uh, so what we believe right now that uh, there may be a regulation in the level of mRNA stability. Uh, that human 
mRNA, you know, it's just not very stable, not codon optimized. So again, that may be opening other opportunities for just targeting that particular mRNA and making it more stable. So there may be different strategies. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, finally, uh, is there one thing that this group can help you to advance your individual work? So this is a shameless plug moment. Oh, how, <laughs> well, you know, of course, uh, funding is a you know, great thing. And we always have more projects than uh, funds to support them. And, uh, you know, having also good uh, motivated people work and join our group, that's what we're also always looking for. So I think these are two components, uh, researchers, uh, young researchers and funds. Wonderful. That's crystal clear. That's exactly, uh, yeah, uh, how, how, how we love it. Thank you so, so, so much, Vera. This was really wonderful. You had some really straight questions too. Uh, I'm so glad we finally got to meet me virtually. Thanks everyone for joining. I see you for the next one. Thanks for staying longer. I really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll be in contact with the recording. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you very much for the great questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.